Good evening. I would like to welcome you to a public forum on the use, the new use in town center of the 715 Main Street Greek Revival Home that is part of the Smith property that the Bolton Conservation Trust has kindly purchased and hopes to turn into a town green. This house, however, has the misfortune of being a little in the way for some of the plans that they have. On April 4th, we had a hearing. Uh, the Historical Commission had a hearing. And we deemed this historically significant home preferably preserved. And that means that we have up to six months to try and help the Conservation Trust find an alternative use for this lovely home, which is really in good condition, but it needs a septic system. This is the biggest problem. So uh, we have a sign-in sheet here. I wish everyone from the public who's here would get a chance to sign that sometime this evening. And I would like to now introduce to you our speaker for the evening, who has toured this house, Ethan Anthony, Principal Architect of Cram and Ferguson in Concord. And he has kindly agreed to speak to us all about some of the ideas that he thinks could uh, put this house to use here in Bolton. So without further delay, let's welcome Mr. Anthony. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, was asked by, uh, by Linda Engelman to uh, visit uh, the house at 715 about, I guess, three or four weeks ago. <coughs> and, uh, oh gosh, it's more than that already, isn't it? <clears throat> but uh, when the uh, application for demolition was first uh, submitted, it was some, sometime after January 22nd. And, um, just a little bit of an explanation of who I am so you understand how, uh, what my ideas are coming from. Uh, most of my work has been in historic preservation or preservation architecture or preservation related. So I've worked on uh, quite a few projects where uh, there's been some controversy about what to do with that project. And I think that most many historic buildings uh, experience a a crisis time very much like 715 is experiencing where the uh, the town, the owners, the, the society around it has to try to figure out how does this building really, if it does, how does it fit into uh, the modern world the way it is right now. We have a word for that, a term we call it adaptive reuse. And it's almost always the case that a historic building uh, to begin with, is not perfectly adapted to it, the current needs of its society, its owners, the institution that owns it. Uh, that's very typical. So one of the main things that, a, that the historic preservation architect does is actually planning for the use of the building. So I really speak about 715 in that perspective. It's, it's um, I'll say, if I have a bias, it's that I always think uh, that we should try to find a way to integrate a, a, a significant building into uh, our current life. I think that's one of the things that's very exciting and interesting about historic architecture. And I just uh, I have to say, I just I get calls all the time about this issue, and some we win and some we lose. We have <coughs> seen, uh, I had a call from the Norway Historical Society a couple of months ago in a panic because they had one remaining real colonial house that was, uh, a, and a demolition permit had been applied for it. They got a six month delay and it was torn down before they could do anything. And it was actually a, quite a tragedy for those people in town who wanted to save the building. And you think of a town like Norway that has very few historical resources. Uh, they're not rich at all in history. And uh, they were devastated to lose that colonial uh, era house. So uh, what, I, what I thought I would do is a way of approaching this. There are so many issues. And if I, I watched the TV show, the, uh, the TV, uh, the hearing, the televised hearing uh, 
I also read the newspaper articles. Linda sent me those. Uh, I visited the house. Uh, I, I've kind of quick studied. I'll be honest with you. I rode past this. I used to ride my bike from Snow here to the. We had sixth grade actually in the uh, that building, the white building, the Houghton building. I'm sorry. We had uh, sixth grade. I rode my bike uh, some just in the beginning of the school year from Snow up here and. And I went to school for a year here, and I went to the Shoba for two years, so I'm not unaware of Bolton Center. I've been through it many times on the bus, uh, so, uh, and, and afterwards. Um, so what I thought I would do is just go through that demolition permit application. Those are all the questions right there. I think that the, uh, commit, the Conservation Commission has uh, laid out their argument for why 715 should be demolished, and I want to just address those questions. If that's the conservation trust. trust. I'm sorry. Trust. trust. Yeah. <laughs> Please excuse my <laughs> my this the steps on those things. Um, <clears throat> one of the first things they uh, they say is that 715 is an example of, is an example of Greek revival architecture. Well, I think that's very good. There is an admission right there that it is. There's some significance to this building. And I was, as I was coming up, I mean, I, for me, Greek Revival has always meant Bolton in a certain way. It's one of the most prominent. There are some very nice colonial houses here. There are some other styles, but Greek Revival is, is such a specific style, and it's so, um, actually so lovely and so interesting in all of its variations that uh, I think it's very sort of specific to Bolton. And I brought this for you, it won't do any good for the television viewers, but if you'd like to pass this book around, this is a really wonderful book on Greek Revival architecture. And I tabbed a few pages in here that just so you can see that there is a tremendous variation in Greek Revival architecture. It, it, you know, it, it goes from you know, very elaborate with uh, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian columns, things that we even identify as Roman uh, are actually really Greek ideas. And uh, so it can be very elaborate, it can be very simple. And I've tabbed both sort of simple, tried to tab the simpler ones in there that are considered very important examples of the style. The next thing they said in their demolition application was that the structure had been modified to the point that the basic <coughs> building no longer has historic significance. I think that's quite a statement. I think it's a big leap to say that. Uh, historic significance is a very broad term. Uh, I would say if they had some expert in here saying that, well, I would have to really look at that expert's credentials and, uh, and try to really understand where that person is coming from. I think the building clearly does have historical significance. It's part of a group of buildings that were this town. And they were all built at about that time, around the 1800 to 1830 which was the height of the Greek Revival movement in America. And it was a very significant movement. It actually started much earlier, of course, with Thomas Jefferson and some of the founding fathers. But it did not become a popular movement until the, after 1800. So these houses that you see here are actually what we might call carpenter Greek, you know, where some, a carpenter is looking in a pattern book and is, is doing uh, copying a, a, a style that is very popular, is wildly popular, all over the country. So <clears throat> this, is, this really establishes the time frame of Bolton Center. It is the fabric of the town. And so I think, yes, the structure has been modified, there's no doubt. But this is also often very true of historic structures. We very rarely come upon a, a, a historic building that doesn't have some modifications made to it over the years. I mean, people do adapt their buildings as they need to. They add rooms, they add porches, they change the siding, they fix the windows. Sure, I mean, this is something that happens, but we don't reject a, a, a historic building because it's been changed. That would, that would mean we would have to reject all historic buildings. There would, Ipswich would be bare. There'd be, we'd level it off. So, you know, we have to really look at these historic buildings in the context uh, that they're in right now. Uh, based on that, I think 715, the, 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 the house in question, 
uh, is still a very viable historic building and a viable as a specimen of Greek architecture. And what I would do were I owning it, and I don't, but were I owning it or determining its fate, I would bring it back. I would say, well, maybe we'll take that porch off. You know, if we don't need it, we'll take it off and we'll take that siding off and who knows, maybe we'll find something really great underneath. The next thing they said that, that really stood out to me was that Bolton has numerous examples of Greek Revival architecture. I see an, a, a message under that, which is, well, we've already got a couple, so we can tear down some. Well, is that really true? You know, can we afford to lose that one? That decision really needs to be made based on the house itself, on, uh, on the totality of the fabric of the town. Is it really uh, something that we can uh, can we afford to lose because we have others? I don't think that's obvious. Um, the fact that there are other Greek revival houses is not a justification for tearing one down. And that would be the case were it any other town in Concord. That would never fly. Nobody would say, gee, we've got lots of Greek revival houses in Concord. Let's tear down a couple because we've got too many. You know, it's not going to happen. The real question is whether any Greek revival structure should be demolished. Because is that a characteristic of the town? Yes, it clearly is. We could say that all of the Greek revival houses in Bolton are a critical part of the fabric of the town. If we were looking at this as a historic district, that's exactly what we would say. Absolutely, unquestionably. Because every single part of it would be important to establish the totality. Uh, I think the character of Bolton Center is established, and I mentioned this before, uh, at least in large part by Greek Revival architecture. It, it, it characterizes Bolton. There are no other towns, I don't know of any other town that I would drive through and say, gee, this has, you know, this is the town that I say is Greek Revival. Bolton really kind of is that. It's a wonderful thing about this town. Uh, it's also true, and this is another point, uh, that the historic character of Bolton Center has already been diminished by the addition of a lot of very contemporary commercial structures. And you know, I don't say that to denigrate what people have done in building new buildings, but inadvertently, they have altered the fabric of the town by the addition of these buildings. <clears throat> now, they have their reasons for doing it, and I don't say anything about that, but I think just in terms of how we look at this as an academic question, as a question of how Bolton is, uh, it, it's, it's unquestionable. They say here that the original siding has been replaced with vinyl and moldings have been replaced. Well, that just speaks to the alteration question. And it's very typical that historic buildings have these alterations made. And it's also equally typical that they're reversed by new owners who want to bring back the historic character. It's not unusual for original features of houses to be filled with wormholes, to have dry rot, and they need to be replaced. As a matter of fact, I have been in recently in France uh, quite a few times. I've been all over looking at great historic buildings there, and you would be amazed at all the new stonework on all those old buildings. Most of them have to be replaced in their entirety every so often because they have a very acid atmosphere, which is dripping those, that marble down and uh, the, the, really eroding the stonework. So it has to be kept up. Uh, the two-story sun porch has been added. Yes, that's true. That's not a reason why the whole building would be no longer historic. Uh, uh, and then they mentioned that the house has been converted into two apartments. It might, yeah, I guess. I mean, that really doesn't, it doesn't speak to the real question of the value of the house or its historic uh, character. The next portion of their uh, report was uh, a number of, of their application was a number of scenarios, which they had suggested as that they had tried, and actually this was also addressed in the, uh, in the hearing. Uh, the various ideas that they had for ways of putting the house to a new productive use. And, um, my feeling was that a lot of those things, and, and this was really verified by the visit we made, uh, a lot of the things that they had suggested they might do with the house were either inappropriate for the house to begin with, uh, moving it, 
for example, from one place to another. Well, of course, that's going to be very expensive to do. That, that means that you really can't do that. Uh, trying to convert it into um, affordable housing, uh, you know, laudable, but not really the right building to do that with, and, and hardly the correct location for it. I mean, right smack in the center of town. It's not, you, you really are looking at possibly commercial use being sensible there, or retail, or something like that. But to try to, uh, I think that one of the problems with their alternative scenarios was they weren't looking at the ones that were actually doable, affordable, and financially viable to begin with. So uh, then they came to the question, why demolish 17 Main Street? And uh, I looked through that, and uh, what their first statement was that the prop this property is old. Well, oh, that logic would say, let's go right through town. I mean, why stop at 715? Let's get, keep going. The next house is just as old. It might even be older. Better tear that one down, too. You know, that is not a good reason. Uh, it requires substantial investment. That's also true of all older buildings. So if you are going to make a commitment to the historic character of the buildings in Bolton, all of them are going to require investment. So that's, that's a substantial commitment. When you buy that property as a private owner, you understand that an older house is a money pit. We all know that. I've had a couple of them myself. They're very expensive to deal with. But when I bought it, I understood that. That was the idea. So I think those are not valid reasons for saying that this is a surplus property in itself. Uh, they talked about zoning waivers, and I think that just really addressed the question of what is the appropriate use of that property going on, going forward. Uh, and uh, I'm not certain, but I think that, is that currently zoned retail? I did not have time to really... It's zoned uh, residential. But there are, all, there are a bunch of retail operations right. going on around it. Yes, the property next to it is retail. Actually, the entire Smith property is zoned. It's pre-existing, non-conforming on a res residential lot. Right, and that was that ran with the previous owner, with the Smiths, and then right. expired. Right, because that started in the 1920s. Right, so that's very typical that you have uh, a zoning that expires, but I think that uh, it's also equally typical that you can apply for a new use that will make it possible to keep that property there. And it's one of the things that you do with historic properties is you, when you repurpose it, when you reimagine a new use for it, you do have to go for a waiver. And I'm not, I don't know why that would be denied by the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, in the case of trying to, um, I don't know the politics of that, but it may very well be one of the problems. That, with that property. Uh, they mentioned then that the demolition opens up the site and increases the frontage, uh, and that there's a possibility of a road crossing from the Wataquatic Hill Road crossing 117. I'm sorry. I think that's crazy because I've been in that intersection, and I cannot imagine a mom with three kids trying to go from Wataquata Hill into that property at 9.30 in the morning with the traffic that's on 117. It would be terribly dangerous. Uh, I think that is a guarantee for a stoplight there. You would have to have a stoplight in order to do that. Now, I don't know. I think there's probably not a lot of support for a stoplight there either. So that's something to think about. This, this plan that, that, that has been presented kind of depends on the idea. When one of the reasons for demolishing the house is to make this straight shot across from Watercott Aquatic Road into the property. I question the value of that. I'm not sure that's even a good idea because there, I would say you really need to do a traffic study to be sure that that works. Um, they mentioned the increase in frontage on Main Street. Frontage is really the size of the lot. That all the frontage is there that is going to be there is already there. Um, I don't see how the frontage increases by demolishing 715. Uh, what it does do is make a much bigger hole in the fabric that is the fabric of Main Street. So if you think about uh, the progression of houses going down Main Street, uh, certainly, when you when the garage is demolished, which I think is a very supportable demolition, 
is going to be quite a large hole now that is not there. That, that, is, that is going to create a large gap in the fabric of Main Street, and having the, the two houses on either side demolished makes that even larger. So I think that that really is going to diminish the feeling of a center in town quite significantly. So uh, it's really questionable whether, from an aesthetic point of view, that's advisable. Uh, they also spoke about a more expansive view from Main Street, and I don't know who's getting that view, because when I drive by, I don't look over there. <laughs> I think it would be extremely dangerous to look over there at that intersection at that point. I think you would be up against Mrs. McGillicuddy pretty quickly. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not sure that some of these things, when you think about the plan, just reveal that there's a lack of thought and planning in that plan. It's just, is that plan making sense? Now, that doesn't, that doesn't have a direct bearing on the demolition of 715, but it does have a bearing on what, it, what the Conservation Trust's view is. And I'm not sure they've thought it through as well as they think they have. You know, they, they appear to have thought very carefully about all of the reasons why they should knock this house down, but the equal amount of thinking hasn't been done. And, that, and I think that is, is a problem. Um, so um, then, care of the new park. Now this is something that is not treated in the demolition application, obviously, and it wasn't actually addressed in the hearing either. This new park, I think, for the Conservation Trust to become whole, would have to be purchased by the town, wouldn't it? I don't know. How are they going to become whole, otherwise? So I think the plan here is we'll, we'll mediate this and then we'll put through a plan through town meeting to buy this property back and we're going to get you to pay to keep up that park because you've got to make the park now. They are going to try to raise some money, but that's a lot of money to raise in this town. They have to raise, uh, they have to raise a significant amount of money to buy the property. We don't know if they'll be able to do that. They have to raise a lot of money to actually create a park. And if they do a parking lot and do something, it'll be two or three hundred thousand very quickly just to make a, a viable park in that location. So now we're up to a half a million. And it's a brownfield as well. Yeah, well, I, I think there, that has been dealt with in some other ways. I think they're getting some money from the EPA for that. They hope to get a $400,000 grant, but the cost for the brownfield can go as high as $950,000. And they have already invested close to $300,000 to purchase it. Well, so all of these, I mean, this all adds up to a significant obligation on someone's part because they've guaranteed this. I mean, members of the Conservation Trust have guaranteed this, that that money has to come back from someone. And that means it either has to be raised from donations or it has to be purchased by the town. So I'm not saying that's bad. Uh, that's perfectly fine to think about it that way. It's just that it's not just the Conservation Trust thinking this through and saying, this is our idea of how this should work. The town is going to be very intimately involved in whatever happens all the way through. And that, that involvement is going to continue through your votes at the town meeting and through your taxes and everything else. So I think um, it's a little bit uh, incorrect and disingenuous to say, we can make this decision because we bought this property. No, they really need the town to support everything that's going to happen. So if there is a significant question, they ought, I think, to step back one minute and say, OK, if there's significant opposition to this plan, we, why don't we get, some, uh, get the uh, town together around the plan? As an architect, one of the things that I do is I build a consensus. And I think uh, if you have a, pro a proposal or a program that you want to make happen, you need to get everyone going in the same direction. Very critical to, to do that. Um, I think once the fund, uh, there is another question that uh, came to me in thinking about what's going to happen with that property. And that is that during the time after they demolish the house, the houses and the garage and everything, the property is going to be sitting there quite some time while they raise funds. What is happening to that property in the meantime? Is it really sensible to demolish before you have the money to actually take care of it? 
I'm not clear that that's the case. Uh, the new light, traffic light at Wadakwata Kill, I, I think it's almost certain that if they create a, an access directly opposite Wadakwata Kill Road, you're going to have a traffic light. It's, it's, you'll have a three or four accidents and that'll be the end of it. Just finished. Um, demolition costs uh, that they actually included in their report, uh, I thought were quite low. Uh, considering that uh, they are going to have to regrade and loan and seed and do some amount of development, even if they don't have the money to do the whole thing. They have to bring that back to some reasonable level of condition. Uh, so those are the things that I picked out as I was reading through uh, their application. Uh, the dates, very interesting and important. Uh, demolition was applied for on January 22nd. Uh, that means they can start demolishing as of June 22nd, I believe, or 23rd. It's actually going to be October 10th because yeah. uh, we had to revise. The application had some errors. Oh, in the okay. Part. I didn't see so that. it really came in on the 19th of February, and then uh, the hearing was the 4th of April. So it's going to be the 4th, actually, of October. Well, so that gives you a little more time. I thought up to you were six months. Yes. Yeah. Up to. Two. Up to six months from the decision at the hearing. <coughs> okay. So. <coughs> I just was looking at it and saying, gee, it looks like you have two months to get this right. straightened out, um, to get, to, to make a, a determination. Um, now, in looking at alternative uses, uh, Linda and I were, after we walked through the house, we were sitting uh, over at the pizza restaurant and talking about it. And, uh, and, and the thing that really occurred to me uh, that, that had not been discussed or considered was um, what would be actually viable uses for property? What are they? Are there any? And, and the one that occurred to me is, uh, is very much that it could make a wonderful art, artist space. And uh, if you think about it, uh, artists are adults. You don't have to worry about deletting or uh, any of those things. Very light use on the septic system and the septic system would be very minimal. Uh, to require required for that. It also uh, would be a space that currently is not available for artists in this town. Uh, there is no low cost uh, space that, uh, and I know there's an arts um, uh, group. Um, it's artisan artisan uh, group uh, that uh, certainly that's the beginning of some interesting uh, possibilities for people who might want to use that space. Uh, but as I thought about it, I thought, you know, Bolton has wonderful, uh, there's a lot of tourism here, especially during the summer and the fall. Uh, those people don't have a prominent location uh, that they can actually advertise their existence and sell uh, the, the artis artisan products that they, uh, that they make. Uh, so it seemed like there, there is something that the town is not providing for some of its residents right now that would be a very viable thing. Well, that got me to thinking about, uh, you know, in Concord, where I used to live, uh, they have something called Emerson uh, uh, Umbrella for the Arts. This is something that uh, was a product of some concerned citizens when one of the schools was declared surplus, one of the uh, elementary schools, the Emerson Elementary School, was declared surplus and a group of concerned citizens decided to take the school on. And I think they, they may have maybe got it for a dollar, most likely. But it was a school that had asbestos, it had all kinds of problems. Uh, one of the reasons why they didn't want to use it any longer as a school was because it had stairs that were inadequate. There were all kinds of code issues. Uh, but it was perfectly fine for art, uh, for art studios. And this really, tails right into something, it's a movement that's really going on right now in Massachusetts. We have something called the Massachusetts Council for, uh, Cultural Council. And what the Cultural Council, uh, it was, was created by the Commonwealth, uh, by the, the legislature, to uh, foster the development of cultural centers in a lot of towns. Because many towns have this, this resource of of uh, art, artisans and uh, antique stores and various things are clustered around the center in the old retail districts that are no longer used for 
pharmacies because they aren't big enough and, and so on. So there are lots of small town centers that are really become obsolete because they don't accommodate modern retail. Uh, but by uh, creating these cultural districts, it creates also uh, places where an artist can give, uh, a dance instructor can give dance lessons to the children in the town and things like that, which are very, very valuable, highly valued things to most residents, especially residents who have children who are at that age. Uh, my kids uh, learn ceramics at Emerson and and, and, and I think that is one of the things, one of the great benefits for uh, the, the, uh, that come out of the development of cultural districts. So that got me to thinking about this property and what the value might be there of a cultural, of really building on the feeling of Bolton, this feeling of a town center, to, to, and, and building on the idea that you're going to have this space which now is available and is not really purposed at the moment, and saying, oh, maybe that could become the nub. They have, they have correctly, I think, identified that as a location for parking. That's a great idea, because when we came to look at 715, the snow was piled, uh, as you know, this winter there was a bit of snow, and we had to park on 117, and that's very nerve-wracking to park there, because it's so busy. Uh, so. Uh, you know, having a place to pull off and park and walk Bolton Center would be a huge benefit. I think the Conservation Trust has that absolutely right. That is absolutely right. The part of it that I think is not right is that just to have that as an empty space. Uh, a common without something around it is not going to uh, be as successful because you really are not drawing people to that area. Other than to go for a walk. But you know, let's face it, I mean, everybody in Bolton has plenty of property. They don't need to go downtown to go for a walk. So who's going to walk there? Okay, so, uh, you know, it's again this thing about, and they do mention actually in the application that there is the idea of doing a downtown plan for Bolton. Well, that should really be coming before the demolition, not after it. So um, a couple of places, uh, you know, just to kind of wrap this up, uh, it, these are some of the places that are receiving, have received planning grants, which from the uh, Mass Cultural Council, uh, Concord has received a planning grant, uh, Essex River Cultural District, uh, Rocky Neck in Gloucester, um, Riverfront Cultural District in Haverhill, Lowell's Canalway District in Lowell, uh, Barnstable. Uh, Marlboro downtown village. Uh, so, you know, there are plenty of places. Uh, Rockport, you know, right, the, uh, the neck, bearskin neck. Uh, all of these places have identified themselves as cultural districts. Now, some of them, like bearskin neck, I think is barely a cultural district. It's more of a retail district, really. Uh, it, it was once an artist colony, but it's not any longer. But let's not let that really stop us from feeling that there's no reason why Bolton Center could not become more a cultural district over time, if that's the direction you want to take. Now, how this happens is uh, it, it starts the way Emerson Umbrella did. It starts with a citizen started corporation, a nonprofit corporation, with the purpose of making the uh, cultural district, of uh, making that happen, raising the money, uh, in, the, in the law, it requires that the town work with a, in a partnership with the arts organizations and other organizations in town, the Historical Society, the Conservation Trust, that everybody work together with the town through the, through the, uh, through the administration of the town, and they provide planning money uh, that you can have for that. So once you start a nonprofit corporation, for the purpose of developing a cultural center for Bolton, let's say, that would become one of the partners in a partnership of all of the organizations in town. Uh, and you can get professional planning assistance through the state funds. So that's one very important avenue that is there for towns. The other avenue is the, is the uh, Massachusetts Historical Commission. 
if, uh, now I, it wasn't clear to me, is Bolton Center a historic district already? It is. It's a national register. It's national register. No problem. You can go immediately, the town can get a, a matching grant for planning, for, uh, for development of the downtown, uh, for preservation, uh, assistance, uh, technical assistance, architectural planning, all of those things are supported through the Mass Historical Commission. They have two grant rounds a year. Uh, one of the, the first grant round, which comes up earlier, uh, I think it's coming up in, um, the next one is in October, and that is the developmental grants. That is where you are, you get, you can get uh, assistance from the state to hire an architect, uh, to hire a planner, uh, historical preservation architect to help you plan for what you're going to do with all of these buildings that are in that historical district. Uh, and then in March, there's a second round, which is uh, money that can be used for actual construction. So were you to, were someone, conservation trust someone, to say, let's save this building, uh, let's go to the town, and let's go to the state, and get uh, some planning money to save it. You can get the architectural money to, to, to turn it back into a perfect jewel, the exact building that it always was or was originally. And it, then you can get the money, you can get 50% of the money. Uh, the maximum grant, I think, is 150000 So you can get up to $75,000 a round. And we have won quite a few grants for different clients. Um, We've won grants for churches in, in Malden and, uh, and all over the state uh, to help achieve that goal of bringing the, the, uh, the historic properties up to snuff, help you to plan for it, and, and accomplish it. So I think, um, you know, as it, just to sum up, I think that Bolton could move in the direction of establishing the center of town as a cultural district. It certainly is a possibility. Uh, the, uh, the first step would be the formation of a nonprofit uh, corporation for that purpose, and it's a citizen corporation. Uh, I think a Bolton Center cultural district would blend the historic uh, quality of the buildings and, and the arts that are already here in town and that could be attractive, and also the popular kind of retail, agricultural business that's already going on all around this town. I mean, people come here just to buy the apples, I do. I mean, it's a wonderful place uh, to come and enjoy the, especially the summer and the fall. Uh, I think the addition of artisan work, musical classes, uh, practice, musical practice space, arts display spaces, you could, uh, Linda and I talked about, it, you know, if we could keep that building at 715 and add some more to it going back into that space. So small, very small scale buildings that would allow you to accommodate that kind of activity, uh, you might be, find yourself with a very uh, excellent little uh, town center uh, that would reinforce all the needs that people have here. So I think the house at 715 Main on a positive note could be used as a kickoff space for that cultural center. Um, it's small, which is fine. Uh, that would be sufficient to serve as a startup space. Uh, such use does not require extensive renovation. You could pretty much use it as it is right now. You would still have to do the septic system, but that's, a, that's basic. You're going to have to do that anyway. Uh, I think there are lots of grants that are possible and help. There are towns all over Massachusetts that are getting these grants. You wouldn't be the first one. There are plenty of towns that are applying for it and getting the help. Um, so, uh, I think that demolition, on the other hand, will ensure that the house will not be there. Uh, it's most <coughs> unlikely that a replacement there would be easy to arrange. I think it would be impossible. Once you lose that house, to try to get it back, to get that type of space back in that location, very, very difficult to do. Uh, there's a strong argument for delaying the demolition and um, I actually think that the Conservation Trust and the Historic Commission and everyone in town are very close on this. It sounds, it seems and feels like there's polarization. I don't see the polarization. I think everybody actually wants the same result. It's just that no one, not everyone is seeing it getting there in the same uh, 
way, and, and the, the end result is a little different. Having a big open space, you know, as a historic preservation architect, I think is a big mistake. Taking away historic fabric, I think, is a big mistake. That's my orientation on, uh, on the problem. So I think if you can get both sides going in the same direction and seeing the, the, the benefit in keeping that house and, and expanding and making something out of that space, you have potential for something really good to happen. So if there are any questions, that's my presentation. Are there any questions or comments? I'd like to point out right at the beginning that actually the Conservation Trust, I think, would ideally like to save the house, but it's a question of finances. They simply can't afford to without help. Well, and that's the, I think, uh, if you're able to slow the demolition down a little bit, long enough that you can form a citizen corporation, uh, a cultural uh, development corporation, you can find your way to getting the support you need to actually save the house. The, the state will support that goal. And they will not pay, by the way, the historic grants do not pay for septic systems, unfortunately. They don't pay for utilities, but they will pay to take that vinyl siding off and restore the original historic character of that house. They will pay to take the porch off and put it back. For taking the, uh, the addition off? Yes, they will. Absolutely. They will pay half of the cost of that. <coughs> yes. Are there any resources you know of uh, if, if they were to uh, look for a you know friendly buyer who would just renovate it as a as a two family or a one family building. Um, I mean I, I think there's a lot of very uh, difficult things about this property and uh, rezoning it is not an issue is is off the table. Yeah. Um, and as Linda said, I, I think the trust is dealing with a lot of issues on that property, mainly about the brownfield. And, you know, we've actually had a couple setbacks. We had a beautiful plan that the town rejected, and it was very economical. So it's going to be very hard to pull up even getting a park in there. And if we don't get a park in there, most of us in the neighborhood are worried about what would end up being in there. So the real thing is, could that house just be renovated? Um, Absolutely. As a historic, you know. But well, it's asking, probably asking too much to expect an outsider to come in and do that for you. And the reason is the profit motive is there. I mean, people need to make money. They need to make uh, a living. They need to make profit on right. their time. And, it, and to do it in a way that actually will work is financially feasible. You really have to do it as a nonprofit because the nonprofit is eligible for the help. The nonprofit can get the grants, but an indi private individual cannot. Now there is one exception to that. Uh, if it's uh, since it's, it is a historic pro uh, property, a developer could develop that as um, and get historic tax credits for doing it. And that's a very uh, I, Linda and I talked about that also. That is a very uh, complex uh, thing, but actually the Bank of, uh, Bank of uh, America is now. Bank of America has a, a department that specializes in doing what they call transfer credits. So they actually sell the credits to investors, and then you can get some money to build to, uh, to, to do the project. The problem is that the individual house, and this is something that they did cover and I agree with in their presentation, the, the, the Conservation Trust. The problem is that this house by itself is a very small project. It's too small to interest the developer. And if you get larger, you, you, you have two issues. One is the zoning, because it, the town doesn't really want something big in there to begin with, I think. Uh, it also seemed to me that all the proposals revolved around something that's kind of a non-starter for the town, which is housing in there. I don't think the town really wants housing in there. And that, you know, to rezone it for housing is, is very difficult. 
I think rezoning it for commercial might be much more popular. And they actually said that in the, uh, in the hearing as well. But it does not need rezoning for housing. <coughs> it might need an easement for the septic, but it's already zoned <coughs> residential. Yes, the entire but what, eight acres are. There was a very interesting point about that. They were only willing to consider that if they could carve off a very tiny little lot just around the house. And that would require rezoning because it wouldn't meet the minimum lot requirements. So I think that the problems were, were creating a lot that was <coughs> small enough that they would be able to sell the rest or get their money back from the rest. I mean, it's a very complex question about how they actually carve that off as a separate. So thing. you're talking about variances and special permits. Yes, yes. actually. I, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think anything that, that, that goes beyond what you can do by right becomes and um, well it will take the cooperation of the town absolutely. and many entities that have already rejected what is being presented so far we've got to start being cohesive and working together I think one of the <clears throat> well that's kind of why I thought of the cultural district because that's a vehicle for that you need a vehicle you know, the, the, the property alone isn't a very good vehicle because it's so directly just that it's the conservation trust and everyone else. Uh, I think if you have a vehicle that says this is something we really want to do with the center of town, it, it comes around the planning for the center. Uh, that it just that's what occurred to me as more uh, an easier way to approach it than trying to approach it directly with just the Well, I want thank to thank you, uh, Mr. Anthony, for your uh, words, and I also uh, appreciate your taking time to help us think more about this and try and find a resolution. I want to mention to the audience we have some handouts up here on the table, a survey of the property, and I must say this house has large rooms, so it would be a really nice space uh, for displaying art on the walls and things, uh, and the floors are in excellent condition, uh, actually narrow hardwood floors. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know our building inspector went through it and he said without the septic problem, it's mainly a paint and patch. And he said if he had the money, he would be interested in refurbishing that house. So we have to think of people that we know who are contractors who would be amenable, you know, the trust has said that they're not asking a fortune for this property if someone wanted to come and revitalize it. So it's up to us to put out our feelers and see what we can do to try and find a solution. I just also wanted to mention in the item a week from last Friday, they had a nice below the fold article about the, uh, the hearing. And we want to thank them for the support. Yes, Mr. Keith. I just wonder, you know, we might have not have questions for um, our guests, and you know, thank you for coming. It was really a great, great talk. Um, but maybe we could just continue to have a discussion yes, here certainly. Um, together and some refreshments. <laughs> um, I guess you know the I I've heard that a lot. You know, I've heard that sentiment used a lot that you know a house is a teardown. And um, this is kind of sentimental, but you know, last at the last meeting of the historical commission, I came uh, with my kids, and I was explaining what was going on in the house and the petition to knock it down. And my seven-year-old son asked, "So, you know, if we sold our house and somebody wanted to knock it down?" you know, they would just have to apply, and if, in six months they could do that. So he was really amazed that even a house that's in good condition, um, you know, could just be knocked down after the six-month cooling-off period. So, you know, that's, it's, you know, it's a little shocking when you're confronted with what could happen uh, to, you know, a structure that's been in this town for so long. And, you know, so I, I think the land trust isn't thinking about this holistically. And they're using, they're using words that developers use, like, you know, it's a teardown. Um, 
you know, we hear that when anybody wants to do something, they want to get rid of something, they say it's not worth renovating, it's a teardown. Uh, they've said it about newer buildings like the salt box. So it's really how the owner looks at a building. So one owner says it's a teardown and he gets a whole bunch of people in town to look at it, look at the maintenance problems and they agree with them. But then we have another owner and he's renovating it. And I think the same is true of my house. You know, I live at 752 Main Street and you know, that house, if you know, we hadn't bought it then and maybe it went through another winter without the heat and the flying squirrels in the attic, you know, and the, you know, the cedar shakes falling off the roof. It could have been a teardown the next year. So it's, these buildings are very vulnerable. And I think we've seen in the last, you know, I've seen in my, you know, short seven years here, I can think of, you know, three old houses that have been, uh, that have been torn down. And, you know, there aren't really that many left. So I, I really think, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I love the land trust. I love what they do. I love that they've stepped in and where, where nobody else would, they stepped in and, uh, you know, bought this property and they're finding a way to clean it up. Um, so, you know, that's very admirable and the people involved are very admirable, but I think just because of that, we shouldn't, hold back being critical about what they're proposing. And I feel like a lot of people here are friends of the trust, a lot of people in town, and they're holding back criticism of the plan. And I, you know, I agree with the architect, the plan is not very good. Um, the steering committee did not do a very good job of meeting with the town, talking about it. It just came out of the blue. It's kind of half-baked, and now they want to knock they want to knock the building down and they want to start fundraising. And I just think that's the wrong way to go about it. The architect is really right. It is about building consensus. Um, so, you know, I love the idea of these grants where we could get money to do some planning because planning or designing for, not just for that building, but for the park because it's not complete. Um, so that's my, my say. Thank you very much. I just want to point out that the Historical Commission has already given <coughs> permission for the cinder block gas station and the Craftsman House to the west of the station for demolition. Uh, and everyone really in their heart, I think, wants to save 715 Main. The people in the Conservation Trust do too, but we have to help them try and find an alternative so that all three of those buildings are not demolished because it will be a big gap. So the, you know, what I'm curious about is what is the value, of, what, what would a real estate agent say the value of that house is? 715? Um, well, yeah, 715. I'm a real estate agent, oh, but I haven't been in 715 recently. <laughs> um, it's basically sound. Uh, because of the yeah. cold, the paint is peeling off, but right. it's it's that's paint patch it has older uh, yeah. facilities for bathrooms, but the big problem is the septic system. Yeah. Now, the thing is, within the plot of land that it's sitting on, and actually, six plus acres belong to the house, the other two that make up the eight right. plus yeah. acres. Has engineering work been done to see? how and where a septic system for that should be put in. Uh, different alternatives have been approached. I have spoken with the uh, official from the Shoba Valley, uh, yeah. from the Shoba, our, our overseeing uh, water, the Shoba, what is it? Water, uh, the Shoba Boards of Health. Yeah. yeah, the Shoba <laughs> Boards of Health. And I have been told that it is possible to have a septic system there. Uh, if you have not a restaurant, which uses a lot of water. If it was right. a single family home, it certainly could be the two family home that it is. Um, it would take some easements or creative, maybe a Presby system or something. Uh, it could mm -hmm. be a pump system that had, uh, that was put back in the land underneath 
the little brook. But that, uh, but yeah. it could be done. Now, if this were to become some sort of a town building, whether it was a cultural center or um, initial anchor to that the town was going to create so that eventually around this park there could be small commercial businesses. Um, would there be a way for any of those to tie into this big town sewer system that we built for the library and the town and the town building? Unfortunately, that won't happen because that would mean that, as I understand it, the Commonwealth would require the town to have a sewer di district and oversee that sewer district. So it cannot be tied into the wastewater into treatment plant. Wastewater they, wastewater. The first place they went to was to the selectmen to see about that. And um, as you remember, when we had the wastewater treatment plant, originally it was planned to be big enough to take the whole yeah. town center. But yeah. it's the, the paperwork and the setting up the sewer districts that the town just didn't apparently want to get into. I, I could add something to that. There are new systems available now that are actually little septic treatment, individual septic right. treatment systems. So you could actually, if you had enough uh, businesses or, or places around that, you could put in its own little yeah. septic treatment system. It's, in fact, you can do it for a house. <laughs> you know, I've, I've designed, I've had one designed for a house in the past. And they can be right yeah. uh, two feet above the uh, groundwater level. It's really quite amazing where you could put them. You can put them in what? Because, I mean, off the top of my head, in addition to an art center with perhaps a coffee shop so that people would have some place, something to do yes. when they were looking at the, at the art and, and some place to meet, because we have precious few of those here. The other thing that would be a great thing for the center of town is a bed and breakfast. Uh, we already have one. Well, we have one, but that gets full. No, we have one the 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 one the, the one on the corner of Harvard and Main Street is going to become a bed and breakfast. Right. But I five Harvard Road? Yes. Yeah, five Harvard. How many beds are they gonna have? I don't know, but that's like just down the street. So. Right. <laughs> right. But you know, this is we're the kind of town I don't wanna see another holiday in Express, <laughs> but you know, a little a house with a coffee shop and two bedrooms upstairs with their own bathrooms would probably do very well. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and I had a you know, brief conversation with the real estate agent, and she said that, you know, these easements, you know, providing easement on your property, like if you're, if you're abutting a neighbor who has a small non-conforming lot, they don't have room for their septic system, you can grant them an easement for a full septic system on your land. So, you know, I think there's, I think the simplest solution, you know, in this case might be the best one. And, you know, I think it, you know, it's a two-family house now, it could either stay that way or it could be a one-family house. And it's really, trying to figure out what the optimal lot size is, what, you know, what does the land trust feel is the optimal lot size for that house, as well as a real estate agent, what could be sold. And, you know, not trying to get a developer to do it, but trying to get, you know, a young couple who wants to move in, maybe they want to have a tenant upstairs or a tenant downstairs, or they want the whole house for themselves. I think that's the simplest solution, and I think there, there's you know enough value in that house that you know they'd be willing to pay, you know, a, a moderate price, you know, its value, and then put more, you know, invest in it over time. The real issue is what is what is the lot size? What does it need to be? What is you know what is the consensus of the town? And then you know an easement in the park for the septic system or, you know, some type of system that is within that 
on the property? Well, I believe that the lot size for the house is over six acres. No, so obviously we, have we to don't shrink. want to sacrifice <clears throat> six acres. You know, that's what we want for the uh, more open space. But it so, would seem that something could be worked out. It's so not it's, like the three yeah. buildings on the east side, which are right. 0 0.3 acres. So which houses are the, those? Are the, the twin are house with yeah. the lamp shop, and then the barn. And the little uh, so that, that that's 0 0.3 acres. 0.3 acres. And then the little blue bungalow next to Houghton. Oh no, that's big. That's that that big. Is, and then what about the the federal house between right next to the old post office? They've got a good lot. Too. They do. Okay. We also have to think about possibly land banking uh, mm -hmm. for a center sewage treatment because. The real thing that condemns these houses is when the septic fails mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. and people don't want to put up with it. Some, some houses do have plenty of land, others uh, there's no hope for anything unless it's creative and uh, easements and those things happen of course when properties change owners and Title V steps in. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. One other related question. Do we have a, a, some cities, one that I used to live in a long time ago, had a homesteading program for um, areas that had become urban blight. And they basically had a lottery for houses and, and what people had to do was to promise to stay in them for 10 years and bring them up to code and make them livable. They were not to change the architectural integrity of the house. I mean, they could use modern fixtures and things like that, but if it was a Greek revival house, it should remain a recognizably Greek revival house. I think basically those are in much larger communities than yeah. our small now community of just under 5,000 right. people. Does that matter? No, but... Uh, I mean, we might have to see if something could be done on maybe a county-wide basis. But, I mean, this, this house would be a great candidate for mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Do the people live in the house? I mean, they obviously live in it while right. it's being... <coughs> right. Or rent. They can rent, too, right? They can't rent. They have no. to. Okay. They have to so. buy it. I mean, the reason there is a tremendous incentive for these people there uh, income restrictions and stuff, but they get the house for very, very little money in exchange for promising to live there for 10 years and to make the necessary improvements on the property to bring it up to code. I don't think we're in that situation. I think people want to live in Bolton. You know, living in that house, you know, you'd be able to walk to the library, walk to school, You'd be next right. to a park. You could walk to Soldiers Field. Town Hall. Town right. Hall. It's, you know, it's a great spot if you like to live on Main Street. And, you know, there are a number of us here who do. And, you know, there are benefits to Main Street as well as it's very safe. That's yes. what I've been told. <laughs> Main Street houses never get broken into. <laughs> 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 right next to the police station and the fire station. So, you know, it's, it, I don't think we have to give it away. I think it has value, and I think it has more value than people think. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you're definitely going to make money rather than spending money to demolish it. And the, the, uh, the land trust could make money <clears throat> selling this building. And they could use that money to do other things on the property. In their report, they had a very nominal amount uh, that they wanted to uh, receive if the house was sold. And I have been told that they could be flexible on that small amount for someone to buy it and revitalize it. Because it, you know, it will take a certain amount of money. To, but it's not going to be, I think, as high as the reports that they had researched up over four hundred thousand dollars to do it. No. Uh, so oh, yeah. we have to try and find people that are interested in uh, revitalizing. 
Well, that's, it seems to me it would be a matter of marketing it, putting it on the, yeah, putting it on the market. Put a banner in front. If you well, here, I think we need to find a friendly buyer that will negotiate with, you know, the different parties. I mean, and, I, I mean, it, it's a, it's a real riddle. So mm -hmm. if we could find somebody, I, I agree with what Jonathan said, that is the simplest way to save the building. I don't think it will pass muster to have it connected with any kind of retail. And I think that if we want to save it, we have to talk to everyone we know to see if we could find a friendly buyer and find have that friendly buyer discuss with the trust how they could, you know, get an easement for their septic and, you know, see it. Get a broker to find a buyer. No. Yeah. I cannot. Okay. You, you, you have a and sale agreement which is subject to <coughs> approvals, uh, whatever you need. Approvals for septic, approval for uh, zoning change. And uh, you had the person sale agreement with the prospective buyer uh, requiring the seller, in this case the conservation trust, to achieve these things within, say, 90 days. And that's done every day. Okay. So it's, it's kind of like, you know. Our house was being sold as is. They didn't know anything about the septic system. It was just as is. You can't bring it up in negotiations. It's like, this is the price, as is. And you know, so we had to do the research, find the septic system. It wasn't in bad condition. They just assumed it was failed. But so it's it's just it's that type of sale though. This is as is, as is price you know, get get some estimates of it and then, you know, yeah, we were gonna have to pay an engineer to design a system, a new system, if the existing one failed. And so, you know, that's the simple process. That would be great. So we have our job cut out for us to try and, and find solutions for this. Uh, we're going to be putting this on the bulletin board of preservation in Massachusetts where uh, houses that are in jeopardy are effectively proposed, advertised to people who would want to revitalize the house. A white knight come in and revitalize it. And uh, I was thinking with the permission of the Con Conservation Trust if we could have a banner in the front door. That just was a small banner that said, this home for sale. Yeah, so to the, get interest. The next step is, you know, is, is the trust serious, you know, that they're willing to put a sign out, like a real estate agent sign, and, yeah. you know, go through that process. That would be the next step. Did you need to subdivide the lot first, though, so it was an official yeah. separate property? That's, yeah, that's part of it. Well, we'd have to do further exploration about the septic and how much property would be needed to make it self-sustaining. I think they're also, just thinking about it as an outsider, um, if I were considering buying the house, I would want to know what the plans for the park were. And I mean, I do know that they're talking about putting a pretty significant parking lot right next to that house. So, uh, you know, if, if somebody who wants to buy in Bolton is going to think right, twice about being next to a parking lot. A parking lot. Mm -hmm. so it, 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 I, not road. that they wouldn't buy it. I think somebody might still buy it. It's yeah. just going to affect the property value. Right. Yeah. Actually, the latest plans, they have a very small parking lot directly in back of the house near the trailhead. And certainly, if those plans uh, came any uh, were more closely examined as far as what we really need. We all know we need parking here in town center. And we really don't want it to be right along the street either. We want it to be toward the back. What is planned for where the other house is on the other side of uh, the Smith property? Open. It's just going to be open. Why can't that be the parking area? 
Well, that's a good question. I think I think the trust <coughs> has a view of cars that's you know is is kind of old fashioned, like that they should be hidden um, and out of sight. But well, that's been a historic preservation view too. No, I mean, uh, no, but you know, that, I think you're right. That's exactly right because um, one of the, the reasons why that fails is because you don't see any activity there. Okay. And the car, for, the peop for people who live in suburban or, or rural areas, the visu visual presence of cars is an indication that somebody's in there and that it's a place you can go. I mean, it makes it more welcoming. So the more you hide the cars, the less successful it can be. So, I mean, That's it's a right. difference between like having a huge parking lot in front, but or rather than like a two two bay parking lot with nice landscaping around it, shade trees and things like that. So it just you know depends, but I think that's the issue. There are ways that parking lots close to the road can be landscaped so that they don't look as intense. I e. Mansfield, Vermont, with all their uh, wholesale shops. The parking's in front, but you don't really realize it because there's so much landscaping and it's broken up so creatively. It's not just a bare parking lot. They haven't fixed on the design for the park. I, I think they have a rough sketch that they've just barely introduced. And to be fair, I mean, I think a lot. there will be a lot of changes to the way their park is. It's just drawn and green. I think they've arrived at the decision to have a park and not do some of their other things they were exploring, like, you know, the housing. There were five scenarios. Yeah, you know, there were many scenarios that they, one by one they've ruled out because they're too difficult to, that they're, they're not feasible. So I, I think they've arrived at this point where they now are committed to just doing a park and no other buildings. So. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. <coughs> and yes. I don't think they've spent a lot of time thinking about the details of the park or the details of 715. So I think that's what the six months is going to reveal, whether it's possible to save 715 in an acceptable way and also get the park. Well, I really want to thank all of you for coming this evening, and especially our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, now it's time to enjoy a few cookies and beverages. And uh, maybe we'll have another public forum in a few months, as if this you know, generates months, more interest. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you so much.